Sean Metcalf is a Microsoft certified master. Fun fact, he's one of 100 people that holds that on this planet. So he's gonna come up here and talk a little bit about Active Directory security. Let's give him a big round of applause. Sean, where are you? There you are. So as mentioned, I'm a Microsoft certified master. I am Sean Metcalf. I also uh, have run a little site called adsecurity.org, which hopefully many of you have used. Let me see hands if you've heard of it at least. If you haven't, talk to the people who are raising their hands as to why. Uh, I won't talk about that. Uh, I've spoken at a number of conferences. Very happy to be at Tech. This is great. I have uh, worked as a, an Active Directory engineer for a long time, pretty much soon after Active Directory was released and I've worked in a large number of organizations or a lot of different types of organizations with their Active Directory and started really pivoting towards the security side of it in say 2003, 2004, 2005 when a lot of the focus was on who can change passwords, who's a member of domain admins. And then certainly in the last five years or so, things got a lot more complicated. So let's talk about that. There we are. So I'm gonna go over uh, the current state of Active Directory, not just on-prem, but also Azure AD, because a lot of organizations have decided to make that move to the cloud, and we'll talk about why. So we're gonna focus on attacking Active Directory, some of the most common uh, types of attacks, and the related security issues that we see at Trimark uh, when we're doing security assessments and working with customers to help them tighten things up, uh, as well as the attacks against Azure AD and Office 365. So attacking Active Directory. Uh, this is something that is interesting to me, personally, of course, because I am an Active Directory person, as I'm sure many are in this room. The issue with Active Directory certainly is that everything gets integrated into it. So we have environments with large VMware farms, and the VMware admins group is in Active Directory. We have large networking configurations, and the network admins are in Active Directory. So attackers have realized that it's not just data, it's out about control. So they're going after Active Directory. They're taking control of it. But attackers require a few different things. They need an account, which are the credentials. They need the rights, the privileges associated with that account. And they need the access. They need to be able to connect to those resources. So when you're thinking about defending or protecting your AD environment, and really any resource, you want to look at these three things. Because if you can protect the credentials of that account, and that account has the rights all the time, and has access all the time, then you have one control point that you're able to protect that environment against an attacker. Or if the credential is a concern, then you can protect one of the other two things. The best thing you can do is protect all three of these. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Because ultimately, the attacker's capability depends on the defender, how you set up the environment. Jessica Payne at Besides Charms keynote last year talked about building the attacker's playground. As a defender, as an IT architect, as an IT system engineer, I want you to think that way. Your environment, that's your home base. You get to configure that and set that up however you like within political, bureaucratic, et cetera, reasons or possibilities but you have that control. And the problem is that traditionally this has been very tough. We've had everyone's a domain admin to administration from anywhere. Uh, search count with AD rights goes into domain admins. We have backups on, use, on regular user workstations. We're gonna throw that backup system into backup operators because sure, why not? We have management systems that control everything. But ultimately, agents are everywhere and a full compromise is very likely because if we continue to manage things the way we have, since the beginning of AD, so 2000 time frame, as we are due now in 2019, we're gonna have some problems. And one of the things that I talk to people about is, as an attacker, is domain admins what they need? No, not at all. Because these rights are everywhere. These are different avenues to compromise. There's GPO permissions, there's AD permissions, There's group nesting, over permission accounts. I'm gonna talk about a number of these and why these are problematic in a lot of organizations. Because as I said, these rights are everywhere. We have workstation admins, we have server admins. What happens with this? Okay, you can't get domain admins, so what I'm gonna do is, in order for you to have admin rights in all the workstations, I'm gonna create a group called workstation admins and nest that into every workstation in the organization. Or, in large organizations, I'm gonna do that 
But then I'm also gonna have OU admins that then are nested in the workstations within those, the, within that OU on those workstations. And server admins often are exchange admins, they're often application admins, they have control over all the servers because that's the way it's always been. And sometimes these server admins end up being admins of domain controllers. Help desk admins have rights on a number of things. It gets more complicated from there, as you know. So one of the things I did in my free time, because I have interest in security and permissions, is I went through and looked at a lot of the different documentation that vendors put out, software vendors. And I found that there was a theme that, of what they wanted. Domain user access, operation system access, AD object rights, install permissions and systems, system rights, start run permissions, AD rights, domain permissions running install. And as I looked at this, I noticed that there was a pattern that was starting to emerge. And maybe a pattern emerges for you too and do a little magic here. But ultimately, all of them really wanted domain admins. Why is this? And I recognize speaking at a conference that's sponsored, sponsored by a large Microsoft vendor uh, is an interesting approach to this. But the thing is that why do they want domain admins? It's easy to develop too. It's easy to test. It's easy for pre-sales. It's easy for install. It's easy for post-sales. It's easy for support after sales. So if I'm a vendor and I have a product that needs to do something in AD at some level, even if it's reading AD, I may just go, yeah, domain admins. We'll do that because everything will work. It's easy button. When we do that easy button, we just make it work, we have some, a variety of issues that we start identifying in that environment. And it is problematic. I have some links here. I'll have the slides on adsecurity.org uh, at some point. But there's a number of references and, and links here where you can review your AD permissions because using the built-in tools are, are not easy. In fact, you're gonna miss a lot of things if that's how you're doing it. So let's talk about the common AD security issues. So this is a list I put together of things that we see at Trimark when we work with customers on helping them do security assessments and tighten up their environment. One of the big things that we still see is that local administrator passwords are not managed on workstations or servers. Microsoft has released their local administrator password solution, or LAPS, and this is a great way, very easy way to get this problem solved, especially on workstations, even if you have a large number of workstations globally. The biggest problem here is that when workstations are deployed, they're often deployed from an image, and that image password rarely changes. Or maybe you have workstation admins that are walking around with a clipboard. Well, how do we know that that clipboard with that password is protected the whole time? I guarantee you it's not. So an attacker just needs to compromise one workstation to compromise them all using uh, Mimikatz, or even just without using Mimikatz, they could use SysInternal's proc dump, they could use a PowerShell script in order to dump LSAS memory. Once they do that, they can export that off the system and run Mimikatz on another system. So if you're looking for Mimikatz, that's not the only problem that, that could be involved here. But once they get that one account on that one workstation, if that account password is the same on all of the others, then they can just move around the environment without some additional protections in place. The other thing that I see is with the domain password policy. Oftentimes, this is the standard seven characters that Active Directory has by default. In at least one situation, I saw that the root domain of an environment had this set to six, but it was higher in the actual child domain. So the root domain, which was originally the concept of Active Directory to have a root domain and put your admins in there and manage the forest from there, having a six character password seems a bit limiting or at least not, not ideal. So then some organizations have increased this to a whopping eight characters. Others have take the, taken this up to maybe even 10 characters. Realistically, we wanna get this to about 12 characters, maybe even 15. And a lot of organizations have approached this from the fact that I need it to be the lowest common denominator because I have mainframes, so I have to keep it to seven or eight. But the fact of the matter is you can use fine grained password policies to actually set a password policy for these special users that need less restrictive password policies or more restrictive. And we often recommend that you use fine grained password policies to enforce a longer password for your admins and your service accounts. Even if you're using a password vault to help uh, update that password. The other problem that we've seen is that a user account is a member of these highly privileged groups. 
And oftentimes it just shows up there because either they have started making the transition or have made the transition from having regular accounts, one account that has rights to everything, to having finally a separate AD admin account. And then part of this is often a situation we see where there's no account naming standard. I had one customer I walked into and was looking at their environment, I said, I'm really confused because I can't figure out who your admins are. I mean, I, I know what they are. I know what accounts are in your groups. I just don't know who's supposed to be there. He goes, ah, yes, exactly. The attacker won't know which ones are supposed to be the admin accounts either. I said, yeah, but that's not the point. <laughs> that's not how this is supposed to work. <laughs> Here's the thing, if I'm looking at this, I don't know who's supposed to be in this, in this group membership. I don't know who's supposed to be your AD admins. And so we started going through the list and we talked about it. I said, here's, here's a printout of who I know are your AD admins. You're not confusing the attacker. You're make, just making it more difficult for you to figure out who should be there. So one of the things that we recommend is making sure that you use some sort of naming standard around this. So that way you can programmatically alert on when an account that doesn't follow the standard goes in there or at least have a pre-populated uh, pre list of who should be in these groups. And using some sort of standard like this makes it a lot easier to identify, okay, this ADA account is logging onto this workstation over here. That's a no-no. We need to stop that because that credential, account credential may be on that system. The other thing that I really, would I really wish people would stop using is account operators. This goes back to the NT4 days when we didn't have really good delegation or no delegation at all. In Active Directory, we have really good delegation capabilities, especially with some tools out there. But the problem with account operators is it kind of has this backdoor access to Active Directory. All the accounts, different other object type uh, control of those, all throughout AD. And in fact, there's been a couple of security issues that have come out in the past couple of issues surrounding account operators. And it's not just me, Microsoft even says, don't use this. Do not use account operators. We wanna be very careful of these default groups that we use, such as account operators, backup operators, group policy creator owners. The other thing we see are really weird group nesting issues. So we have our domain admins group, in that is a group uh, called AD admins. AD admins has a group called critical server admins. Inside critical server admins are server admins because no one really knows what rights server admins has or critical server admins. And then before you know it, you have a regular account, uh, Wesley Crusher, that's in that group who probably should not be a domain admin in the organization. The other thing we see a lot are default domain controller policies that are just default. So this is what it looks like when you stand up Active Directory. There's not a lot here. Security controls are very minimal because this hasn't really changed since the early days of AD as well. There are some base policy settings that you can put here that help increase the security of your AD. Uh, these have been put out by CIS and others. If you look at these and start implementing these, you will in help in improve the security of your environment, especially if you start looking at NTLM authentication. A lot of organizations have the NTLM auth to allow LM and NTLM v1 in the, in the environment, which is problematic from a security perspective. One of the biggest issues that we always see are accounts with old passwords. This is a big issue, especially with service accounts. That service account for SCCM or for MOM or for a vulnerability scanner or for SQL or for, I don't know why VMware is on here. These are the things that we need to look at when we're looking at our AD is to, first of all, do these accounts belong here? Uh, why are they here? And oftentimes the answer to that is, you know what, Bob set that up. Okay, can I talk to Bob? No, he left five years ago. Okay, so why is there this random uh, you know, service count here in domain admins or the administrators group? Uh, we're not sure. Okay, so what rights does it actually require? We don't know. Okay, so you have an application with a service account, but you don't really know how it's being used. How is this supported? How is this supportable in the environment if you're not sure? We want to make sure that these old passwords, I don't know about you, but my password from 10 years ago was horrible. My passwords today are marginally better. I get really concerned when I see that the default uh, domain administrator account password hasn't been changed in 14 and a half years. That's a big red flag for me. 
But the service accounts and domain admins is a really big issue. Uh, this is one of the things that oftentimes organizations are like, we can't change that. So one of the things that we do a lot is to work with organizations to help them better figure out what these rights are and get these removed. Um, one of the common ones that we, we often see, vulnerability scan account, because we need to make sure our security tools can, can scan everything, right? But a better way to do this is to break it out into the tiers. Microsoft has put forth this tier model for a number of years now. This works for these service counts as well. I don't think anyone would agree that it's a good idea for a single vulnerability scanning account to be able to log on to or scan workstations as well as our domain controllers. That seems like a really bad idea to me. I always point out, what if this account hiccups? What if there's a problem with it? What if the security tool had a coding mistake and all of a sudden the credential was left behind on a workstation or all the workstations in the organization? This is a big issue because just about every organization has one vulnerability scanner account that's in domain admins. The other one I see a lot is AGPM, despite the fact that Microsoft's put out delegation advice of how to delegate that account out. But of course, one of the initial parts of the documentation says you can use domain admins, and then, okay, use domain admins. Another really big one that I see probably 30% of the time are the default domain administrator accounts in Active Directory that have a service principal name associated with them. This means at some point this account, uh, in this example, since it has a SQL spin, was actually running as a service for SQL. And this is the most common scenario that we see whenever we find a spin on the uh, default domain administrator account. This account should never be used, obviously. It should be your break glass account. And all an attacker needs to do is run some PowerShell code like this uh, that Tim Medina talked about when he came up with the concept of Kerber roasting. And the interesting thing about this is we just request a service ticket for this spin. We don't have to do anything with it. We just need to get that service ticket and make sure that it's encrypted using RC4. And we take it offline, and then we can basically brute force it. And this is virtually invisible. Um, I did publish a couple years ago about how to detect Kerber roasting. Uh, using the event ID for uh, Kerbero service ticket request, as well as creating a Honey Token account that has a spin that doesn't go anywhere. That way you know if someone requests that, it's probably Kerberos thing, because no one should ever be requesting it, because we just made it up. The other one is server GPOs linked to domain controllers. Uh, this, is, this happens a lot. There doesn't seem to be a good guidance around how to use GPOs and how to link them in environments. So a lot of times we see that the server policy is linked to domain controllers as well as the servers. There's a couple of problems with this. Um, one is this effect of other things happening that you don't want to necessarily happen, which means that, let's say, uh, like a lot of organizations, you want server admins to have admin rights to all your servers, so you set that up in the server policy. Well, what ends up happening is that server admins group ends up getting added to the, uh, the administrators group within Active Directory, that domain. And that's just one of the things that can happen. You can change the security policy of the domain controllers. Uh, you really can reduce the security of your Active Directory by doing this. So we don't recommend doing this. We recommend using dedicated ones. That way you know what policies are applying to your domain controllers. But also, you don't want a random account to have the ability to modify GPOs that apply to your group, to your domain controllers. Why? Because, well, obviously, group policy can install, run code. Uh, we can make modifications to the administrators group. We can change a lot of settings through group policy. We can own those systems through that. So if this regular server account, admin account, Nick Fury, someone compromises his account, then what ends up happening is the attacker has full control over the environment because of this group policy modify rights. So we want to make sure only our AD admins have modify rights on GPOs linked to the domain controllers OU, but also we recommend at the domain level. Because if you control the GPOs at the domain level, those GPOs apply to domain controllers as well as most of or pretty much everything in your domain, depending on your OU inheritance. The other thing that gets challenging is obviously this domain permission delegations. I talked about this when I was starting as being a, a big issue. These are the delegations that have been set up in Active Directory from years ago, and no one knows but Joe who set them up, 
when AD was first stood up 15, 18 years ago. And no one knows about it. It hasn't harmed anything. It hasn't had any problems. But you end up in a situation where maybe domain computers have full control to all users in your domain because of this. I don't know why. Uh, server admins have generic, uh, sorry, write property on all computers in your domain. These are things that can lead to much bigger problems because these groups aren't expected to have these level of rights. Then there's the issue with delegating to the admin SD holder. Admin SD holder is obviously that special thing, that special process that protects your most privileged groups and accounts in the environment. So who has the ability to modify, uh, or at least the permission rights that are set on the admin SD holder object have the build, those same abilities on domain admins and the admin accounts. And for some reason, this has been delegated. So user admins have the ability to write to all the properties on all the objects in both of these domains, which is a big problem. These are the things that don't often get caught by your, scan, your typical scanning tool. Security tools don't normally look at that. There is a tool called Bloodhound um, that will look at permissions and pull that in and provide some graph interface information. Uh, but you have to go through the graph to kind of walk through that. Uh, the references I, I provided earlier will help uh, figure out what this is. There's a Microsoft PFE blog that has a really good PowerShell script on how to get this information. There's a couple of others that are able to dump and show you some non-default privileges. Big problem. <laughs> big, big problem. Admin use regular workstations for AD admin. This is pretty much everywhere, and I get it. I understand the, the challenges with this. Red Forest is this massive boulder that is almost impossible to move. And as part of that, having a separate admin workstation is a huge lift, not just from operations, but it's also difficult from the political and budgetary perspective. I get it. But why is this a big deal? Well, we have one workstation in our environment. That workstation will have maybe 30 accounts in the local administrators group and maybe 50 accounts that have local admin rights through some sort of software management system. And then 20 accounts with control of the computer via security agent or agents. Again, things that are able to install and run code. Then you end up with about 100 accounts that have effective admin rights on this workstation. This is why it's important to have a separate system, even if it's a virtual system, where you're typing in your, your AD admin credentials. Even if you're protecting your RDP uh, connectivity via some sort of MFA system like Duo, the attacker doesn't need to do that once they have these credentials. They can connect directly to the domain controllers via LDAP and then take over the entire environment. Because the real question is also how many GPOs apply to this workstation? How many accounts have modified rights to those GPOs? What other control plane issues are there in this environment for those workstations? There are a number of varying degrees of control of these workstations that we can put in place, at least moving them up to a root level OU, at least putting them outside of what the standard patching process is and having them auto patch through WSUS or something like that. Because the real question is when you have domain admins in your environment, who has control of those workstations? The other problem is accounts with delegated rights to AD. So delegated rights aren't just group membership. There are AD delegated permissions, group policy delegation, and then the group policy user rights assignments, which I've learned no one really looks at once they're set up. And this is something we see a lot of the time, is allow log on locally on domain controllers and the ability to log in via RDP. Those two rights mean that I can log in to the domain controllers via RDP, assuming that the RDP protocol is available to the network. So I can log in from anywhere as long as I have membership of this group. The other one that we see probably about 15% of the time, which I wish we never did, <laughs> is this other one. Domain users have the ability to log on locally to domain controllers. I remember talking to a customer about this and highlighting this and their default domain control controllers uh, policy. And the person, one of the people that was at the table, sitting there, had an interesting look on his face, got up, ran out of the room, didn't see him for about three minutes. And when he came in, he was a lot less excited because he went like this and he's like, yeah, Sean's right. He was able to log on to the domain controllers interactively using 
a regular domain user account. Now they can't connect in via RDP, but there's other ways that you can log on locally. We have remote KVMs, we have Hyper-V, VMware consoles. All of those are remote logins, or sorry, log, log on local logons, interactive logons. The other thing we see a lot, way too often, domain controllers with minimum event auditing. So the standard auditing configuration is going to be set there because that's from 2000, 2003. Around the 2008 timeframe, there were a lot of additional security configurations and, and auditing that was uh, put into Windows. I think it went from like nine to 52 different categories or components of auditing, which should be set. The advanced auditing should be set today. Uh, often they're not, or this amazing setting here is not set. This t says that basically if you have those advanced auditing set on your server and you have the standard auditing set, your advanced auditing should overwrite your standard auditing. Why this isn't set as default, I don't know. But if you have both, you want to make sure that this is set because if it's not set, you may just have standard auditing configured on your domain controllers. The other thing is your SIM vendor will often have the older settings configured in their documentation and not talk about the newer advanced settings. Or maybe if your SIM was set up in, let's say, 2010 or earlier, it may still be on the standard auditing configuration. Kerberos delegation. This is one of those weird things that uh, I know that when I was an AD admin, I didn't really understand because uh, it wasn't very well documented for the admin. It was really documented for the developers. Developers, developers, developers. But delegation is impersonation. And so I'm just going to cover a few of them here uh, as far as what these Kerberos delegation items are. But realistically, the most important one you want to be aware of is your unconstrained delegation. Unconstrained delegation is what AD launched with. This is delegation where you can, as, a, as an admin, delegate to a service account or computer account the ability for that account to impersonate a user to any Kerberos service on the network. How does it do this? Well, when the user gets their service ticket, the proof of identity to that service, the domain controller will put their Kerberos TGT, their authentication ticket, their proof of identity for the network into that service ticket so that when the service ticket is delivered by the user, their computer, to that system, it is extracted and loaded into memory. So that way that application has all the user's TGTs. This is a really big problem because going back to the vulnerability scanning example that I, I mentioned earlier, what happens if you have unconstrained servers in your environment and your vulnerability scanning tool uses Kerberos for authentication? And one of these application servers that you scan has unconstrained delegation. Well, guess what? That vulnerability scanning account that's in domain admins has now Place, had its TGT, its proof of identity from the network placed onto that server. It's a vulnerability point for the environment. So we definitely want to make sure that this very confusing <laughs> checkbox is checked for our, our AD admins. Account is sensitive and cannot be delegated. You can also add them to protected users. We recommend both. You can't do this for service accounts. So that's why it's really important to make sure that service accounts are configured with only the rights that, they are, requ that are required. Cross-force administration, this is something that everybody does. Because Microsoft said that when you set a trust, a one-way trust, you're good, right? This means that Forest B is gonna trust Forest A, which means that we can have our happy admin over here at Forest A, who is a domain admin in Forest A, we can have them administer Forest B as well. So what we do is we take Forest A's domain admin account, we go ahead and uh, have our Forest A domain admins manage our Forest B, this happens all the time. The problem is that Forest B does not have the same security level and controls as Forest A does. So what this means is Forest B gets compromised, which includes the domain controllers. Once that Forest A domain admin logs in via RDP to Forest B's domain controllers, that attacker now has that credential from Forest A. They don't need to jump the trust, they just need to connect to Forest A with that admin account. And before you know it, Forest A is compromised as well. So we want to be really careful with how we do cross-force administration. We typically recommend that 
if you're going to do cross-force administration, that what you do is you have a, an account that's in your production, uh, uh, production domain that's just a regular user account in that domain, and you can go ahead and add that to the main admins in the other uh, system. Or just keep administration within that other system. A lot of customers end up using an enterprise password vault to do something like this. So let's talk about cloud. Cloud is this wonderful, mysterious thing. Cloud is magic. Everyone wants to go to the cloud. Rainbows and unicorns. Uh, of course, we all know that the cloud is just a data center, or many data centers. But this is a huge paradigm shift for us. We're going from servers to services, domain to a subscription, domain admin, subscription admin. Not really past the hash, but a credential pivot or, or token uh, theft. And now it's public. We use management IPs. Uh, RDP is still available, uh, depending on how it's configured. But when we're talking SaaS applications, uh, no RDP. It's all APIs. And there's challenges here. Security controls we know we've used for many, many years on-prem to varying levels of success. But the cloud is constantly changing. Uh, if you're an Office 365 subscriber, you get a weekly email or so outlining everything that's changed. You log into the portal, you get a list of all the things that have changed. It's constantly changing and, and evolving. And these security capabilities and controls that we have in the cloud vary by vendor, by service, by availability, and oftentimes have an additional cost, which means that when that contract with that cloud vendor was originally no negotiated, probably doesn't include those controls because they cost more money. One of the things that I hear a lot from different customers, especially in the past couple years, as customers have gone from, I'm never going to the cloud, to we're going to the cloud. Um, one customer actually hired a, a cloud innovation person to come in and help them figure out how to cloud enable their environment. But what I hear is, I'm gonna migrate my on-prem AD to Azure AD. I'm gonna move to the cloud. And we know that it doesn't quite work like that. Um, so for those who didn't laugh or didn't nod their head, uh, we know our on-prem AD. We know that we have all this management type stuff, right? In Azure AD, this is a multi-tenant cloud-based directory. Uh, we don't have group policy. You have to go with something like Intune to do that, and even then it's definitely not group policy. We don't have the same controls or capability as we do natively as we do in Active Directory. We're now looking at the AD Graph a API, which is a REST API, in order to interact with AD. We can use PowerShell uh, modules to do so, for sure. But the authentication model is completely different. Uh, there is no Kerberos, there is no NTLM, unless you look at the hosted AD version that Microsoft has or Amazon has. So it's a very different type of environment. This is a huge paradigm shift. Uh, who here has been working with Active Directory since, uh, I'd say, 2000? Yeah. Huge paradigm shift, right? I'm sure your minds were blown like mine was and, and trying to figure out and track this down. In addition to all the work you already have with Active Directory, which means you get hit with all the identity issues as well as those integration issues. Now it's all moved to the cloud. One of the things that's a big part of this is that there's sync tools for just about every cloud app that's out there. And these sync tools want to have at least a user account to grab all your user and potentially group data and send it up to the cloud. What are these even doing? How do we know what they are? Any business unit, random business unit, can go ahead and set this up. They just need a regular user account. If you have Office 365, you probably have Azure AD Connect, which is doing some synchronization, and you can, you can adjust that very granularly. That's not always the case with these sync tools. So I got bored one day, and I was like, I wonder how many different applications or products have these sync tools. And I put a partial list of this, certainly the bigger names that I found. I was a little shocked to see some of these. Uh, but it makes sense, because in order for these cloud environments to understand what you have in your AD, your user accounts, your groups, et cetera, they have to have some sort of sync into that environment. My biggest question is, what are all the attributes that are getting synced? And it's not always clear. So I mentioned Azure AD Connect. At DEF CON a couple years ago, I dug into the permissions that were part of this that were installed as part of an ex express setting install. So when you click on Express Settings for Azure AD Connect, 
it goes ahead and sets up a bunch of writes, assuming that you're going to do everything, which includes password sync, which have these two writes here. Now, if you followed security over the past few years, you probably recognize that this, these are the two writes that are required to do something called DC sync. DC sync is an attacker-based tool, which does effectively what Azure AD Connect does and requests the password hashes for users from domain controllers. If you have these two writes, that's all you need in order to request that, which is why Azure AD Connect gets that. That also means that Azure AD Connect is a big target in your environment. And if you've run the Express tool, Microsoft very helpfully said, hey, by the way, Azure AD Connect is installed on this computer. It syncs with this tenant. And this is the service account. So as an attacker, that's very interesting to me because I know exactly which computer account I want to go after. But even without that, I can figure out what service accounts have these rights. And a lot of times, there's multiple service accounts that have at least directory changes, but sometimes, I'm sorry, DS replication get changes, but sometimes they also have get changes all. Get changes all includes that sensitive information in AD. The DS rep, rep, uh, replication get changes provides the ability to bypass the typical security controls and get information about the uh, uh, objects and their attributes in Active Directory. So the two of these provides very sensitive, very powerful capability within Active Directory. So this means that as the attacker, we're just going to figure out where this computer is, and we find that it's in the root OU called servers. Okay, that seems pretty standard. Then we're going to use a PowerView command. Uh, PowerView is a tool written by Will Schroeder. He identified needed to, as part of red team assessments, to be able to have some PowerShell tools that interact with Active Directory. The cool thing about Find GPO Computer Admin is it will scan an OU, identify all the group policies that it can read, that add or update uh, the local administrator's group. So what it tells me here is that the server admins group, which is in the root groups OU, is getting added to the local administrators group within all of the computer objects or all, on all the computers that are in this server's OU. Okay, so that's one area that I could go after, server admins. Or since I see that it's in a group's OU, I could see who has rights to modify uh, any of the groups in that, in that OU. Then we go ahead and look at the other group policy that's there. So we have a server baseline policy. Uh, we have also have a server config policy. Now what's really interesting here is someone went delegation crazy and they said, you know what, server one, two, and three needs to modify this, this group policy without thinking about who's in server tier one, tier two, and tier three. This is a bit unusual from a tiering perspective because normally you wouldn't give all three tiers the ability to edit the settings, but it's fairly common in most organizations to over-delegate. This means that I can go after server admins, but instead of that, I could just look at my server tiers. If I could compromise an account server tier one, I could modify this group policy, add my account or all users to the local administrators group on this server that runs Azure AD Connect and then compromise that server to compromise Active Directory. And ultimately get some rights into Azure AD as well because that sync account has some rights there also. Um, Dirk Jan gave a, a great talk at DEF CON this year about attacking Azure AD Connect from programmatically and getting some data as well as uh, some tax against Office 365. So here's the scenario, this is more for later. Uh, but basically, my attack options are going after server admins, server tier, or the groups themselves in the groups OU. Just because this Azure AD Connect server is in the regular servers OU along with everything else. So my tip of the day is if you have an Azure AD Connect server, make sure that that's protected like a domain controller, as well as your ADFS servers as well as any, any enterprise password alt servers. Make sure that those are in a special OU. This is a slide that just covers some of the things I was talking about, but it's not just Azure AD Connect. Um, I learned earlier this year that there's a cloud provider, I'm not gonna name who they are, but at least with Azure AD Connect, that password hash that it requests from the domain controllers is hashed, and there's a number of additional functions that are done to it before it's sent up to Azure AD. This other tool from this other cloud provider, which again, I'm not gonna name, what it does is it takes the password hashes from Active Directory and sends them straight up to the cloud without any modification at all. 
I happened to be in the room with the, with the customer when they were talking to this vendor, and they said, hey, Sean, what, what do you think about this? I said, that's a horrible idea. And the person who was with the, uh, from the vendor there uh, was talking to him. I didn't realize this. And he goes, well, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, you can't just take the, the actual hash from AD and send it up to the cloud environment and store it there. How do I know how you're protecting it? How do I know that it's isolated from others? How do I know that you're not doing anything extra to it, like encrypting it or doing something to protect that data? Since if that was extracted, it could be used directly against the, the on-prem AD. It says, oh, well, we have a white paper that has all that information. I said, I'd love to read that. Later on, I'm back to doing the work that I was originally hired to do. But I hear in the background, I don't like that guy. <laughs> I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to help make things better. <laughs> so let's talk about recon. Obviously, on, in, in the on-prem environment, if we have a user account, we can get information about our AD as long as we can connect to a domain controller, which we can because we can do LDAP and we can do other things. In Azure AD, it's a little bit different. Azure AD and Office 365, by default, is available to the internet. So all I need is a regular user account and be on the internet somewhere. And I can get some recon information about that environment. And there's a number of different tools that provide this capability. One of the interesting things about this is that the first one here, this O365 Creeper is, I give it a list of email addresses, and it will go through and attempt to authenticate through the Office 365 authentication page, one by one by one, just to see what the result code is. And so if I give it the list of email addresses, it will tell me which ones are valid users. It's pretty interesting. The others here, I need a, uh, an actual user account with a password that works so that way I can get the data and, and, and get, pull the data from the environment. But if I have a list of users for an environment, and I also have some additional uh, DNS recon slides that I wasn't able to put in this deck, but basically I can recon and look for that MS equals uh, reg domain registration that Microsoft uses for Office 365 to validate that you have the domain you say you do. I can look at that text record on your DNS that's external and public uh, to identify that you do have Office 365. So I can kind of walk through this process. Does this organization have Office 365? Um, what are the email addresses, the email address format? And once I get that one account, then I can do a number of uh, recon activities. Or I could just password spray. Password spray, a lot of people are familiar with it at this point, but I'll cover it very briefly, is instead of trying a bunch of different passwords against a single account, I'm going to take one, one password, try it against all the accounts. Then I'm going to sleep for a little while, and then I'm going to use another one. And in doing so, I can avoid typical lockout, as well as triggering any kind of issues that the users may notice. Ah, but Sean, we use symbols in our passwords. Y yeah, it's easy. <laughs> so password spraying is one of the most common attacks against Office 365 and Active Direct, uh, Azure AD, as well as your on-prem AD environment. Uh, I have also published some information on detecting password spraying for your on-prem AD. So password spraying, uh, there are a number of different toolkits out there that work. They, use, they can use different Office 365 services in order to get that information and, and attempt to authenticate. Why does this work? Because legacy authentication is enabled by default. Legacy auth is not just older versions of Outlook. This is POP, IMAP, SMTP, those things that only understand a username and a password and nothing else. So if you saw the articles that came out this week uh, from ZDNet and others about how Microsoft said that MFA uh, prevents 99.9% .9 of the attacks, it's true with one small caveat. You want to make sure that you disable legacy authentication because MFA alone will not save you because these protocols do not understand MFA. So even if you've MFA'd the account, someone could potentially use these protocols to pull the email from that account if they guess the password. So password spraying, let's see what it looks like. So we go ahead and run our password spray against our Office 365 environment, which again is by default public on the internet, and we got some passwords here. So we go through and take that list, put it to the side, some bad passwords in this environment, obviously. And how do we detect this? One of the biggest things is that we need are Azure AD sign-in logs, which require Azure AD Premium, P1 or P2. I've been told by Microsoft that soon that will not be the case. Soon you will be able to access all your sign-in logs 
without having these uh, additional subscriptions. Yeah, thank you. Um, they won't give dates, of course, um, but <laughs> I've been told soon. But we need these logs. So effectively, they're shifting from you don't get access to them to it controls how long the retention policy is for these. And about 100% of these password spray attacks are using legacy authentication. So by turning off legacy authentication, this will block this. So we can detect password spraying through looking at these logs. Uh, we'll notice that there's failures, failure, success. And really, if we want to build a good uh, detection around this, we need to understand what those uh, error codes are. So error code 50126 and this other client's older office clients. This is also a really good thing to do today to, uh, to check to see which clients are actually using legacy auth. So if they're using one of the older email clients on their phones, not one of the ones that actually prompts them or can prompt them for MFA. iOS, since I think it's been several years now since it supports the modern AD, uh, uh, Azure AD libraries or ADAL, uh, work just fine. But these older clients, other clients means legacy auth. So defenses, obviously disable legacy auth. You still want to make sure MFA is configured for your admins and disable this service access for users uh, where you can disable the protocols for your users. Uh, so if you can't turn off legacy authentication for everyone, you can at least turn off IMAP, POP, et cetera, for your users. And you can do this through an, an exchange authentication policy. So that way you can cover a number of users. Uh, ADFS, so that's if you are just using Azure AD for your authentication off 65. If you're using ADFS like a lot of organizations are, you want to make sure smart lockout is enabled for 2012 R2, 2016. And you can block legacy authentication with these ADFS authorization rules. So keep in mind the auth happens first, then the rule happens, which means that you'll still see those authentication requests. But the, one of the best things you can do is install Azure AD Connect Health with ADFS, which from what I've seen, almost no one knows what it is. So raise your hand if you know what this is. It's okay if you don't. Yeah, so in a room of experts, only three people know about it. So this is what I've been trying to tell Microsoft is that no one knows about it. Why? Because it's called Azure AD Connect Health. This is not helpful. What's cool about this is it will give you alerts about common ADFS issues, like your cert going to be expiring soon, but also will alert on bad password attempts and risky IPs. And this will show up in your Azure console. Very helpful. My feedback to Microsoft is to please change the name, because Connect Health does not help. If it's a security thing, we want it. If it's a health thing, we've got a lot of things that monitor health. But the other thing we can do for password spraying defense is this Azure AD password protection, which is another name I'm not terribly fond of, because it doesn't tell you at all this is for on-prem. Basically, this takes the old password filter uh, approach that Microsoft had from very early on, and adds in all of the known bad passwords that Azure AD sees, and then does some scoring against them when users try to change their password like password123. And will at least alert, or you can configure it to block. But the issue is that we moved from this on-prem environment to this cloud administration, which means we went from MMCs to the cloud, from our ADUC to a web browser, or PowerShell. And this means that going after cloud administration can be easy as just looking to see who our global admins are. Remember those pass accounts I password sprayed? Now I know what their passwords are. And if they don't require MFA, I own this environment from a very simple perspective. This was not difficult to do. The other thing is, just from a few weeks ago, Bleeping Computer had this article that has this very interesting fish that says, Office 365 admin, check your payment information. Your subscription has expired. I'm going to delete all your stuff. Even in a pilot mode, this would freak out an admin, and they would be close to at least clicking and logging in, if, if not already logged in and, and, and uh, tried to fix this. One of the reasons why we have too many global admins is because, well, we haven't had a good reader role for everything. Microsoft is changing this. I was allowed at Black Hat to announce or at least talk about Global Reader, which is in uh, private preview. So if you don't know about it and you have a TAM, talk to your TAM about how to configure the Global Reader role. Um, it provides read access to all the Office 365 services that Global Admin can read or write. It's still in private preview, which means that it is uh, being configured across all the services, so it hasn't made it to everything yet. But eventually, Global Reader will have the ability to view all the configuration information across all the Office 365 services. So we're talking uh, Teams, Yammer, 
um, SharePoint Exchange. Exchange has been good because we've had those RBAC roles forever, right? So there's a good read-only um, role there. But we haven't had that for the others, which oftentimes means that we've had to put people in global admins, or we've had to put service accounts that run PowerShell or do something else to give us that information. But when we're looking at cloud administration, we're going to find a weakness. We're going to go after the workstation or the web browser or, the, or redirect DNS to something else or figure out how to break this HTTP uh, session, which hopefully is encrypted. And one of the most common cloud browsers or web browsers in any environment is Chrome, Google Chrome. Why? Because they provide these really great group policy configuration, which means that we can control it much like we could with IE, but we have better ability uh, to go to uh, the web and, and view all the things we want to. But there's this one setting here that's very interesting to me as an attacker, and that is configure the list of forced installed apps and extensions. So as I talked about earlier, we want to make sure our AD admins are not logging on to regular workstations, but we want to do the same thing with our cloud admins. But we want to protect our cloud admins and not just have them use regular workstations with their regular user account. Why? Because if I'm an attacker and I get control of a help desk account or a workstation admin, I can modify the group policy to force install an extension that I have created that is extracting those cookies that store the token information. So with cloud, once you authenticate to your cloud environment, you get a token that's good for a certain amount of time. In the Microsoft world, that's usually about an hour. So if I take that token and put it somewhere else on the internet, even with conditional access, that token is my proof to that of, of identity to that service. So if I can extract that token and reuse it, then I own that environment. The same thing that's interesting about this is I can also put in this extension to split that session. So the user's interacting with Azure AD, and I could be connected in from somewhere else using this extension to do other things without that user actually seeing things. Another interesting thing is a lot of enterprises have an SSL TLS decryption device. Well, what would happen if I could compromise that device? Maybe the... Uh, the Azure AD, all of the Office 365 uh, admin URLs are whitelisted. Maybe they're not. But even if they are, if I can compromise this device, then I can grab that token because remember, it's going to break that SSL TLS session at that decryption device. Same scenario if I can modify the DNS or if I can trick the admin into going somewhere else, like to a, a server that I control, and then I just proxy them uh, to their cloud admin website. Anyone guess what this number is? Admin accounts with MFA, global admins with MFA, controlled through conditional access as well as on the account? Give me a number, come on. Huh? What's that? How about that, 8%. It's gone up slightly, but we really want this number to go up higher, because this is bad. And there's a lot of different ways to do this, I'm not gonna cover all of them, but Conditional access, there's a baseline policy for admins in public preview that I've been told is going to change uh, based on feedback. So, but privilege identity management is good as well. Um, I'll have these slides up for reference soon. But we want to protect our cloud admins. We want to make sure that they have a special environment, at least a, a cloud admin server they can RDP into in the environment and do administration from that server. Uh, use something like Cloud VDI or even an admin workstation. I am almost out of time, so I'm just going to cover this quickly. One of the biggest issues we've seen is we see on Twitter, our team is currently looking to put reports of stolen passwords. Stay tuned. Inevitably, that password list gets dumped, SHA-1, easy to, to uh, guess what that is, and then we end up with a list of our corporate email accounts that are in there. Now, just using their corporate email on this website is, is what they've done, but it's possible that that password is the same on their corporate environment as well as what was in the dump. So one of the good ways to detect this is you can sign up for haveibeenpwned.com or use the password hash uh, of the AD hash sync uh, through Azure AD Connect because Microsoft will give you this uh, users with leaked credential report. So turning that on gives a number of different benefits, including leaked credential reporting. Also, when something catastrophic happens with your on-prem AD environment, you can switch over to having Azure AD enable your users to log on directly to your Office 365 services just by flipping a bit. And then there's apps. Apps are a big issue because it's not just Office 365, and there's toolkits out there on how to, to basically fool a user into approving an app that they think is doing one thing but it's really doing something else. 
Uh, like I said, there's attack toolkits where this pops up. The user thinks it's a legit app, so they click accept, giving them rights to everything. But it's also in Google, too. Uh, install Google Defender. Yes, I want that. So I give access to this app to all my files, my Gmail, uh, as well as my Google Drive files. So this is Pondstorm written by, up by Trend Micro. And the same thing can happen if an attacker has global admin rights for just a few minutes to the Office 365 environment. Uh, this is not the real app, by the way. And it has a ton of rights that it's asking for. So we want to make sure that we review our, our apps and, and the rights that are associated with them. Because just like we would on our phone, we want to make sure that we protect our environment. And uh, there is a PowerShell script that Microsoft has published on GitHub uh, in order to uh, run through and check these permissions and provide some information about it. But you can also check admin consent and user consent through the portal. Again, I don't have time to go over these, the go do right now, as well as the uh, go do soon, but the, uh, I will have the slides up on AD Security soon. So that's been my time. Thank you very much for yours.